You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Do you know what's going on in the world of futures options? Well, let's find out together. It is time for TWIFO this week in futures options. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever scintillating, at least we tend to think so, Options Insider radio network member pretty much got a flavor for all of you out there if you like to hang out on demand listen on your device of choice at your leisure it's all there for you if you like a little bit more engagement you want to get in there on the live and hang out on the live then of course there's the plus if you want to go beyond and get some exclusive content on top of it then we've got the secret club for all of you folks out there you can get on over to the options slash pro is the place to go to check it all out slash shop will get you to the comparison you can see it all there as well and you too can join the party throughout the week. Remember, of course, you also get bumped to the front of the line for all the questions and all the other fun stuff that we do here on the network. And of course, however you listen live after the fact, do keep hitting us up. Your questions, your comments, they tell us what you're into, interested in, what you're into, what you're trading right now, and they help steer the massive ship that is TWIFO. And joining me to help me steer the ship today, we have our old friend, Mr. Dan Gramza from Gramza Capital Management. Dan Welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It has been too long. Well, great to be with you, Mark. I'm happy to hear your voice and also to explore some of these markets that are really cranking. We have some interesting things happening in the futures marketplace, and I'm looking forward to exploring those with you. You picked a good one today, Dan. There's a lot popping off. So let's get to it with our Movers and Shakers report. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down the biggest movers and shakers to the upside and to the downside. What's rocking and rolling over there at CME this week? We usually tweet out this report ahead of the show. You can also get it CME. If you follow them, we'll tweet it out as well. So if you want to see it for yourselves, that's the best way to do it. Of course, if you're on the premium quick strike side, you can generate this report for yourself as well out there. So, Mr. Dan, you know what we have to do now, sir. Where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side or to the dark side, sir? Well, I have to tell you, they're both very exciting and a little puzzling. So I'm really looking forward to exploring these. Well, I'll tell you what, let, let's start with the let's start with the light side. You're more of a light side kind of guy. So I kind of expect Yeah, yeah, that. I kind of am. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> but you're right. They are interesting and or puzzling. I think you can pick your adjective and they both apply to both of them this week. So let's start with our top five here. Number five, you know, it's a weird week. When Bitcoin's only number five, listeners, Bitcoin up 2.36%. It was number two in the same direction last week, up 8.62%. So a good couple of weeks for Bitcoin, even if 10% in a couple of weeks is kind of a rounding error for Bitcoin these days. Number four, going out to the rates with the Ultra Bond up 2.9%. And then we go out to AGS. We've got quite the smattering this week in the top five here. Oats. Up 4.16%. Then we're out to the metals with palladium. So again, we're kind of all over the place this week, which makes it kind of fascinating. Palladium up 7.8%. It was number three in the same direction last week, up 6.63%. So a good week for a good couple of weeks earlier for palladium. Before you get into it, before you ask, 451 contracts. I checked right before showtime. So unfortunately, not a lot of paper to parse in palladium land. And then number one with the bullet, again, Dan said it's kind of a strange one this week. And this kind of exemplifies it. And number one is iron ore up 20.73%. It was in the exact same spot last week, up number one as well, up nearly 18%, 17.94%. So my goodness, what a couple of weeks, 40% for iron ore. Now let's go on out to the dark side, to the red side of the screen, listeners. Again, you know it's kind of a crazy week when the Russell 2000 could sell off about 5% and not even break into the bottom five. It's only actually about a number 10. <laughs> so that shows you how much red was on the screen. This is definitely about a two-thirds to one-third dark side to light side week this week, listeners. A lot of red on the screen. Some of that obviously exacerbated by what we're seeing out there today but let's go on out to the dark side movers and shakers listeners and let's see we've got number five is actually copper so going back on out to the copper land with off nearly seven and a half percent out there today number four out to brent off 7.84 percent Number three, WTI off about 9.1% this week. So an interesting week for WTI. Uh, number two, RBOB. I'm getting a trend to the dark side here, Dan. <laughs> number two, RBOB. So three in a row, we got Brent, WTI, and now RBOB. RBOB off 9.67%. And then number one, again, getting back to the weirdness <laughs> you mentioned before, listeners. We've got our old friend, Lean Hogs, topping the dark side this week off 20.32% this week. So an interesting week here for Lean Hogs. And again, before you ask, it does some paper, about 25,000 contracts. We have broken it down on the show not too long ago. So it may be possible and may indeed be time for a return to the land of lean togs. Get that hashtag ready for hashtag hog love. But we're not going to go there just yet, listeners, because pretty much all the headlines, all the interest, all the attention this week has been out there in the energy side of the space. So let's start there first. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody, welcome to Energy. You guys know where to find these reports for yourselves. See me, group.com 
slash twifo or slash twio twio both of those should work once you're there head on into the drop down go to energy go down to wti and that is where we will begin our journey this week and again a lot of the narrative has been kind of just the the drubbing that crude has taken out there of late wti coming into the show at about a 63 half 63 60 right around that level off about six and three quarters percent just this week and as we mentioned uh, since our last show off 9.1 percent so it's been a rough week out there in energy land course a bit of a one-two punch of course the lingering impact of the delta variant on demand those concerns are being raised on top of of course the fed spooking everybody this week and uh, so a lot of interest on what's going on in the energy space uh, Dan, we'll start there. I know you do your daily videos over there at Dan Grams. I got to imagine a lot of your viewers and a lot of the people you engage with are coming to you to ask about energy these days. So what's been lighting up your tape in the land of crude oil these days, sir? Well, it, Ash, I have to tell you, Mark, it surprises me. Uh, I felt that crude would stay in about a 65 to $75 a barrel sideways move, that we'd stay in about that really through the end of the year. But we're not seeing that kind of action. We're seeing a little more weakness. We're below that 65, uh, 63 in that range. Uh, I'm looking for a bounce here, though. If if you look at the bigger picture, first, we think our economies globally are not fully turned on yet. So there is some demand out there that's not engaged in the marketplace. If we think about it, now, on the supply side, we have a lot of supply globally. Even the wells that we've seen here in the, the Bakken area, North and South Dakota, down in Texas, uh, New Mexico, those, a lot of that production did get throttled down, but it's getting turned back on because at these price levels, uh, these operators can now operate at a profit. So the ad expectation in terms of supply, I think, is still very high. OPEC is trying to figure out how to make this all work uh, in terms of do they add now more production, which they're contemplating. Uh, is that a good thing? You know, there's a lot of countries that are concerned about losing market share. When they pull back production, that means somebody else is going to fill that spot. So we see that tug of war going on as well, too. Now, if we think about the demand side, though, I think internationally, we got to talk about China. China, India, their demand, their energy demand is actually going up. We see it not only in crude oil, but in liquid natural gas, LNG. Uh, the U.S. now is really back up there in terms of one of the world's largest exporters of uh, natural gas. And that doesn't show any signs of abating. So the energy sector, it seems the demand is there. Let's go back to crude, though. Uh, but not enough. Not enough to absorb that. Now, there's one other factor, I think, that we sometimes forget about when it comes to crude oil. Crude oil, as you know, Mark, is priced in dollars. So when we talk about those numbers, they're U.S. dollars. Well, the dollar has a big influence here. If I'm an oil producer, and if when I what do I do? I get U.S. dollars when I sell my crude oil. I get those dollars. I go to my bank and say, I got some dollars. Please give me my currency. Well, the relationship of the U.S. dollar to my currency has a huge impact on my income. So if the U.S. dollar is stronger, which means I get more of my currency, then that's actually not favorable for crude oil prices. If the U.S. dollar is weaker, that means I get less of my currency when I turn those dollars in. So one of the ways it's felt that that offset occurs when the U.S. dollar is weaker is that we see higher crude oil prices. It puts some upward pressure on crude oil. But that's not what we're seeing. And we also have a very strong U.S. dollar right now. And so that helps put some downward pressure on crude oil prices. That being said, I think we need to be cautious at these levels. This would be a logical place for crude oil to bounce. So if you're on the short side, 
uh, you want to monitor the price action that we're going to be seeing here over the next couple of days. Let's see what we are seeing out there. Again, cmegroup.com slash TWIFO, then go to the energy drop down, then to WTI listeners. You'll see all this. Some decent paper on the tape this week, closing in on half a million contracts right now in WTI. And of that, pretty much exactly 40% going up in the October contract. Has about 28 days to go, so we're going to hang our hat out there, listeners. Uh, Vol-wise, we're seeing Vol ticking up out there in WTI. Uh, speaking of Vol, I've taken a little bit of, uh, of a jaunt a journey through the sea vol indices out there, listeners. You know, Derek's been on here a few times, Derek Salmon from CME, kind of breaking down the latest addition to the volatility landscape out. This might be kind of interesting to start, I thought, keeping an eye on these because they offer them now for a wide variety of different complexes. Dan, have you had a chance to check out these sea vol indices at all, especially some of the ones getting into your energies and your metals? Have you had a chance to check these out at all, Dan? Well, I have to tell you, I have been looking at them. And what's what I find interesting, and Derek is the right guy for you to talk to about this, is I, I think it's due. The, the, this product line is due. We see how it gives us insights into the equity world, as you mentioned. Uh, it's another reference that people have to get a feel for what's happening right now in the marketplace. What is a reasonable volatility level? What does it mean to us if that expands or contracts? What is the impact? And especially if you and I want to look at options, do we see it being felt in the option complex that we're looking at? You know, what is that? Is it another clue that we have to kind of monitor of what's happening with volatility. Because as we all know, that's such an important parameter when it comes to options. It's such a key variable that we want to get our hands around and get a perception of and its impact on option pricing. Well, let's check out some of those levels out here. Again, you can go to the energy drop. They have a bunch of different sea vols. They have a heating oil. They have WTI, which is where we're going to look at. It's at about 38 right now. Remember, sea vol is just the end of day closing right now. So this is at a 38 off about a quarter of a point. This is from yesterday's close, obviously. So a little bit of a change today. But if we look out to the, the October contract, which is about 30 days out, that's going to line up pretty closely. With the, with the C-Vol methodology, that's about a, at about a 38 and a quarter, the October Vol. They're up about 5.3 points this week. So things getting a little bit frothy, a little bit juicier. It makes sense. We're selling off. We had seen the bid to the put wing in crude oil. So as we continue to drop down, you can see the Vol tick higher. It's kind of like an equity. And that's pretty much what we're seeing out there right now. Speaking of skew, let's see how it's lining up. Last week, the puts were 10.2% rich to the at the money. This week, 106 So maintaining that firmness out there, in spite of the fact that we have been moving down a little bit. Calls last week, 9% cheap. This week, a little bit cheaper, 9.4% cheap. So usually when you sell off, you see the puts tend to come in a little bit. You see the calls get tend to get bid unless we see an aggressive movement out there. But this week, we're seeing you know continued downside, and the puts continue to stay firm, and the calls continue to stay cheap, which is interesting. Let's see what the most active trade is out there. I said we're at about a 63.5, 63.60 out there in that front future. And looks like the OC 60 puts, 6-0, were the number one trade out there with about almost 19,000 contracts on the tape. Most active day is today with about half of that, about almost 9,000 <laughs> going up today, followed by about 3,700 on Tuesday and Wednesday, 2,600 on Monday, mostly scattered throughout the week, so we can't really tell of opening or closing on this. And then we also had some Action for number two, actually. It wasn't all puts, listen. It was some calls as well. D75s going up again pretty actively. About 17,000 contracts this week. The big day again today, interestingly enough. 8,000 going up today, about 8,200. 5,500 yesterday, 2,500 on Monday. The rest scattered throughout the week. Again, the other days kind of back and forth, and we obviously can't tell what the OI is for today. But uh, intriguing, D75s that didn't have that on my bingo card when I came in here for WTI. Let's just see really quickly back to October. Any other interesting prints? Also, 65 puts. That makes a little bit more sense. That's effectively was an at-the-money, now an in-the-money put out there doing about 16,000 contracts. The big days were yesterday with about 4,400 and Monday with about 4,100 going up 
this week. Also had some 75s trading in October, but fewer, about 11,000. The big day was Monday with about 5,100. So 60 puts, 65 puts, and 75 calls. Let's look a little bit farther afield to see if we see any other strange things. <laughs> well, if you want the uh, Jan 2023 120s, they did trade this week 100 times. <laughs> Always some weird stuff afoot, even though not exactly a sizable trade. Dece of 2022 70s also getting some action this week, going up 5,000 times pretty much today. Looks like it might be a 70, 85, 2,400 by 4,800, 2,400 of the 85s, 4,800 of the 70s. And then it's like all kinds of weird stuff. 65s, 100s trading for Weird levels across the board. Might have been a weird strip starting at the 58 halves, going all the way up to the pars in Dece of 2022 for various weird ratios. All of that trading today, which is, again, strange. But interesting stuff afoot here in energy. Since we're hanging out in energy, we saw some other names lighting it up out there this week as well. Uh, our Bob, not a huge mover, though, and also Brent. Not a huge options player out there as well. So, Mr. Dan, I will allow you to choose where we go next. Which of these movers and shakers? They're kind of all over the place. So which one catches your fancy, sir? Well, you're giving us a lot of choices. Um, if we go back to the light side, shall we talk about iron ore? There's not going to be much on the option side, though, at that market. Yeah, not a ton on iron ore, but uh, we can, well, palladium, not really as well. What about yeah. what about if we head out to ag, sir? Number three. Sure. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, everybody. Welcome to the ags portion of the show where we get our hands dirty. We really dig in to the contracts here if you want to find the oats drop out of the energy go back up to agriculture click on grains and oil seeds and drop on down to oats there's quite a few things in there scroll past corn and beans and everything else get all the way down to oats and you will find our bad boy unfortunately listeners <laughs> it does a whopping 42 contracts listeners so not exactly the bad boy we needed to have but of course the real reason i wanted to jump into ags is because, you know, I'm a, I'm a sucker. Listen, I mentioned it earlier. I'm a sucker for the livestock, which is also included under ags. And we don't always get a chance to talk about lean hogs. We did it recently because they were moving. And they're moving again this week. Listeners off 20 and a third percent. And you might say, does it do a lot of paper? Yeah, 25,000 contracts on the tape for lean hogs. So I apologize for misdirecting you there, Mr. Dan. But we're going to hang out really quickly in the land of the livestock. I know it's not a product a lot of you follow or really can follow. It's typically a trade by appointment type of thing, changing up a little bit these days, though. Uh, but still, it's fascinating to watch what is going on in this market. It's actually up ever so slightly on the week, up about <laughs> a quarter of a point. <laughs> but uh, since last show, it's off, obviously, quite a bit here. And in terms of action, 60 odd percent of that 25,000 contracts, we got 59.8 to be precise, of this paper was in the October contract, which goes away here in 56 days. So you got some time here for October. If you're wondering what is the vol out here in lean hogs, perfectly reasonable question. It's at about a 27 and a half. It's actually off two and a half points. So a fair bit more volatile than let's say your large cap equities, it's right around the level of volatility we're seeing out there in small caps these days, but still a little bit more juice than you might see in some of these other products, certainly more than in, let's say, an interest rate product, most of them at least, for example. And of that, let's see, the skew last week, the puts 19.1% rich. This week, 14.2% rich. So the puts uh, coming in a little bit, almost exactly five points. The calls last week, 12.6% cheap. This week, 11.7% cheap. So the calls kind of hanging out at pretty much the same level. And in terms of action, I said we're at about an 86 and three quarters in that front future. And it was the 80 puts in October doing the lion's share of the action this week, doing about 1,500 contracts. That isn't a ton, but again, for lean hogs, that's a lot. And again, 25,000 contracts, 1,500 is actually quite a bit. 
And most of those going up yesterday, about 750, pretty much half of the paper, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. All that opening. So opening paper on the 80 puts, which are a wee bit out of the money here, nearly seven handles out of the money right now. We also saw some action. That wasn't enough for you. We had about 1,100 of the 92, 92 even calls going up this week. Kind of active throughout the week. The big day, though, was today with about 600 and change going up today. Also, the 90 calls. That's I would expect a more even money strike, but that's what we got there as well. 1,100 of those as well. Uh, the big day for those was actually yesterday, 430 of those. Again, most of that paper on both of those strikes, particularly the 90s, was biased towards opening. Uh, Mr. Dan, I kind of bait and switched you there a little bit. But if you have any thoughts on the livestock, if this is the market you follow, have at it. And B, the ags have been moving and shaking. Unfortunately, the only one that's really lighting it up this week is oats, which doesn't do a lot of paper. If you have any thoughts on the general ags complex as well, have at it. Well, I, I can tell you the, the lean hogs is an interesting market. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> see, it chokes me up just thinking about it. You're, but, getting, you're getting too excited about the ags. Yeah, the exactly. Uh, but it, the action that we're seeing here, I wonder if it is sustainable. One of the things that I pay attention to, and I think the meat complex is a, a great example of this, is when we see certain price behavior, what's driving it? Is it is it a market that uh, we see a lot of hedging in? And you know, the meat complex is a, a great example of that kind of behavior. Eighty nine, we're finding sellers at at lean hogs, so they're trying to lock in those higher prices. If I'm, you know, going to be selling lean hogs, that's what I want to do. And is that what we're seeing driving this right now? And where have we seen, we're trading 86, but where have we seen buyers coming in? It goes all the way down here to 84. Uh, that's where we've seen buyers lock in prices, not only recently back in August, but we saw it back in July, back in June, buyers have come in at that level. So that would be the expectation for this right now. It's also interesting when you went through in a great way, the option side of this market. Uh, I think it's very logical. We're getting a feel for what are the expectations that people have for this market. You know, that's one of the beauties of options. It gives us a clue about outlook. What what are people's perception of a market? And right now they're looking for weaker prices. Now, this market puzzles me in that it doesn't seem to make total sense. If you look at global supply, and global demand now for this market, um, it hasn't gone away. If you look at China, one of the, lar the largest consumer of hogs and producer of hogs, you know, China purchased, let's do this, Smithfields. Remember the, the, the um, tariffs that were put on exporting pork? Yes. Right? Remember that? And Smithfields, one of the largest exporters of hogs, is owned by China. So when China starts putting tariffs on and does different things as well, they're putting it on a product line that they also need. Uh, they consume huge amounts of hogs, and they still need our product line. So it's hard to imagine this really falling much below 84 but it can, and it may. And right now, the outlook is bearish for this market. I would look for further movement down, but I think we should be cautious here, too, because we're approaching levels that it appears people are hedging on the buy side for this. If I'm going to be, in, in this regard, if I'm going to be a buyer of hogs, uh, I want to be looking to lock in some hedges. And I think over the next few moves if indeed we move down towards 84 that's some of the action we could start seeing there and that kind of creates that longer term outlook for that market i mean if we stay in in meats if we think about uh, uh live cattle <clears throat> excuse me that's another market that's at significant levels uh, at 124 we've seen sellers up there four times five times Every time it got to 124, it sold off because people are probably putting on those hedges. And around 122 to 121, if you're in that market, 
you want to be careful there because that's where buyers have come in before. So it's also kind of that range-bound market. And so for hogs and for cattle, I'm looking for sideways moves in that regard. So not no drama in terms of huge moves down, but rather sideways movements. And you know where there's no shortage of drama, Mr. Dan, it's in the equities and volatility space. So let's hang our hats there next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of equities, a place where a lot of you hang out throughout the day here. And we're going to go out to that drop down back on out of the hashtag hog love. <laughs> Get on over to the equity indice. Scroll on down to the Russell 2000. That's where we're going to be hanging our hats here. Next, you'll see coming into Showtime, Russell 2000, still north of that 2000 level, but taking a bit of a drubbing here. Of course, you mentioned it was outside of our bottom five. It was actually number 10 this week off 4.9%. It's actually off about 4.2% just this week. So a lot of that sell-off obviously coming this week, indeed, just in the last few sessions, really. And uh, so coming at showtime, we're at about a 2130 out there in this Russell 2000. Wasn't that long ago, Sean and I were talking about, man, Russell 2000, north of 2000 party. We needed to have one of those. We never got around to doing it because we never really got in person again. But someday we shall have that party Yet again here. And in terms of what's lighting it up, you know, it's pretty much keeping the faith with equities these days. Uh, pretty much, again, a lot of paper on the table this week. 31,000 contracts already out there. Of that, nearly half, 41% going up in the contract <laughs> that has exactly one day to go, August week three. It's, it's like clockwork with the equities and Russell 2000 in particular. That's where all you folks want to play, the stuff that's going away the dodo tomorrow. Let's go on out instead to September. That has about a full month to go. And that did about 23% of the paper this week. Let's see, Vol, if you want, oh, before I even did that, I got ahead of myself. I forgot to do my setting of the table for the equity space in terms of breaking down the Vol landscape. For a while now, we've been saying, you know, what's going to happen to RBX? Will it break below 20 or will it break above 30? Well, we have our answer this week, listeners. Coming into showtime, RBX, a.k.a. the VIX of the Russell 2000, was at a 30.02. So we're back up there in that 30 handle for RBX, listeners. That's interesting. It's been a little while since we've seen that. Up about five and a third points from this time last week. VIX, no slouch itself, but can't really keep up with small caps in this kind of environment. VIX was at about a 21 and a half. Coming into showtime. So again, frothy rich back in the 20 handle for VIX and up nearly six points from last week, 5.9 points from this time last week. Uh, VVIX, which is the volatility of volatility at about a 129. Just throwing that out there for anyone out there playing in our question of the week this week. Vol Q at about a 20 almost exactly. So remember, if you listen to the shows earlier this week, it was languishing around a 15 on our show last week was at a 16 because it's up exactly four points from this time last week. It puts that VIX to RBX spread. So the small cap to large cap spread at about eight and a half points. That's about half a point tighter than it was this time last week. And the VIX to vol Q. So the S and P 500 to NASDAQ vol spread at about one and a half points. It's actually getting somewhat wide. That's about one point wider than it was this time last week. That spread's been kind of tight of late as kind of NASDAQ and and SPX have kind of been moving from a vol perspective in lockstep. These days, it's spreading out a little bit out there again. Uh, Mr. Dan, a lot of table setting here. A lot going on, obviously, in the world of equities and volatility. What's been lighting up your tape out there this week, sir? Well, you know, Mark, it, it, I find it fascinating. It, it's, and let's think about some of the things that may have stimulated this marketplace. How much of an impact Afghanistan uh, has had here is, I guess, debatable, uh, terrible situation that I hope gets resolved. But let's think more, I guess, about re retail sales. Retail sales were a little bit disappointing in the U.S. We also had some other economic data that wasn't as positive as we expected. We also saw that in China. China's retail sales were down. 
And the big deal about retail sales, it means that people are spending money when they, when we see those numbers going up. And in the U.S., our GDP, 70% of it is based on consumer spending. So people think of it as that bellwether for our economy. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that demand has gone away, actually. And maybe it did get throttled down a little bit with this new variant that's out there as things slowed down some. So we are seeing some economic softness. But let's talk about the Fed which I believe is the world's most powerful economic organization. Uh, what they do does have an impact, not only on us, but on our friends as well in other countries. But let's think about what the Fed did. The Fed in their minutes, they said, you know something, maybe, maybe if the numbers are supporting it, maybe towards the end of this year, we'll cut back, we'll taper back some of our purchasing of securities. That's it. Now, is that new? No. Has the Fed said all along, you know, if the economic numbers support it, we're going to make some changes. Yes, they have said that consistently for over a year, and then some. So it's not really new information, but let's think about what it does to these markets that you're talking about. It's a psychological impact as well. You know, the market says, well, if the Fed does something by reducing something in terms of support, that means their economy is doing well. Hmm. But then on the other hand, it means it's taking away support. Oh, yeah, that's not good. So will the economy continue to do well? Is the Fed putting this out there just to get us desensitized? Is that what it's doing? Because we can see how sensitive the market is to just that idea. I mean, I discount that kind of information when it comes to what the Fed said. And the reason I do is it's not reality. Did the Fed say tomorrow we're going to taper? No, they didn't say that. They said maybe at the end of the year. So it's not reality. It's the possibility. And that's what we're seeing the market react to. So personally, I have a hard time being bearish on this marketplace. And I do look for further movement back to the upside. We've approached levels, even in the Russell, that's really been leading the way lower, which does surprise me because the Russell, those small to mid cap companies, typically has a tendency to lead the indices. And in this case, it led them to lower levels, I guess. But I think we have to be very cautious on the short side for these markets. Uh, when we look at that relationship on the skew and also between the puts and the calls, that may give us some insights. But I, I'm right now looking for a movement back up. I think this is more of a profit taking move. We're at levels that we found buyers before across the board in the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the Russell. So these would be logical levels to get a bounce. And uh, so we're seeing a reaction to a possibility that's not reality. And I think getting a bounce and moving back up towards the end of this week, tomorrow, will be important. Because just one other thought there, Mark, and that is this. What does tomorrow tell us? Fridays are such an interesting day. If buyers are coming back into the market today, and then tomorrow we drop right back down and close on the low, what does that say to us? It says that people are not confident going home short into this weekend. Or I should say they're long going into this weekend as sellers come back into the market. If, on the other hand, on Friday, we have a positive close, it says you know, buyers came back in and they're willing to hold on to these positions. What will also be interesting is, is that reflected in the options? Is this change in attitude reflected in the options? And Friday may give us some insights. So I think Friday's close is going to be important. And I do look for a positive close across the board in these indices.
Yeah, it's, it is a fascinating time. You're right, weighing all these different inputs. You know, Afghanistan seemed like a big driver at the beginning of the week, but the market has has shaken off far more traumatic events than that over the course of the past year and a half. And of course, you could argue a lot of the V-shaped recovery has been on the back of the Fed. And now if the Fed says maybe it's getting a bit out of the game, that could be enough to really shatter some confidence out there. And it certainly was the thing that spooked markets and drove a lot of vol up out there this week. Again, let's go back on out to the TWIFO report. Go to the drop down for Russell 2000 where we started before we got distracted by all this fun with volatility out here. And again, like we said, about 23% of the action going up out here in September. That vol at about a 25 and a half, which is actually a little bit below where the RVX is right now, which is kind of interesting, showing that there's RVX also incorporates some skew and some other things in there. So there's other, other factors afoot than just the, uh, the straight 30-day vol out there in the Russell 2000 in terms of skew the last week the puts 16 and a half percent rich this week 15.1 percent so the puts actually coming in a little bit again as we kind of break through some strikes typically that is what you see and then 11.9 percent cheaper the calls last week this week 12.9 percent cheap so the calls actually getting cheaper which is interesting and not typically what you see out there so again vol popping nearly five points out there in the SEP contract the most active contract this week Everyone's asking about, you know, upside calls, upside calls. And the 2200s going out tomorrow, we're pretty active, about 1,000 of those this week. But we actually had the 1710 puts in September. It was pretty much neck and neck. It was all puts. 1710 puts in September and also the 16 half puts in the, looks like the, yeah, these are, what are these, week three of October here, doing all both about 1,500 contracts each. So kind of a tie between both of those. So those are both. Fairly out of the money puts. <laughs> We're at about a 2130, like I mentioned, listeners, uh, coming into this part of the show. So you're talking substantially out of the money puts, which has kind of always been the other side of the story out there in the rut options and always a bit of a head scratcher. Looks like actually the 1710 puts were closing. Pretty much all 1500 of them went up on Wednesday and they pretty much closed them all. So that was closing paper on the 1710s. Let's look at the 16 halves really quickly. Maybe they rolled and yeah that was opening on the same day on wednesday so i have to figure maybe a bit of a roll from sep out to week three of october getting themselves pretty much another 30 days on this uh on this bad boy and yeah 15 so it looks like it's exactly a roll which is interesting so someone keeping that downside put frenzy alive here for another month in Russell 2000. Yeah, there's some interesting paper afoot out here. Oh, you know what? That's not enough for you. If you want a little bit more smaller delta calls, these are out to D, so they have a little bit of a delta left to them, but they would qualify as small. These are the 24 halves going up about a 1,000 times this week as well. Pretty much all opening. A good chunk going up today as well, about half of them, 500 going up today. So 24 halves, 2200, 24 halves going out in December, 2200s going out tomorrow and the 17 10 puts and 16 half puts are going out in September, which we're closing, of course, and then out in October to reopen and re-roll. So upside calls and uh, downside puts, kind of what you might expect, but in some interesting fashion and some interesting size out here. We're kind of coming up against it here. I want to get some listeners as well. But before we do that, how about we make, let's see, looking at our our top five movers and shakers here. Let's go to, let's do one more quick stop, Dan. We haven't hit on metals yet, so let's head out there quickly next. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everybody. Welcome to the metals. Go out to that drop down, get out of equities, go into the metals. Usually we hang out in precious, going to talk some gold or some silver. Not today. We're going to go one below that, listeners, to the base. We're going to get base today because copper is number five on our dark side movers off 7.5%. Also doing some paper this week, about 17,500 contracts. That's not euro dollars paper, but also for copper, which used to struggle to do like 1,000 contracts not too long ago. That's pretty decent paper. And again, copper has been interesting to watch. You know, the flagging demand out there, concerns about Delta variant impacting that. You know, copper is also a bit of a proxy for China. 
It's all that weighing on copper. Again, off about 7.5% since the last show and actually off nearly 8% since Monday. So pretty much all that sell-off coming this week. It's hovering right around the four handle right now, 4.04 to be precise, off about a third of a point out here. And again, about 17,500 contracts on the tape. Most of that going up in the SEP contract that's going out in seven days. <laughs> so let's go a little bit farther out, listeners. About a quarter of that paper went up in October. That has about a mo- over a month to go, about 39 days to go. So we'll hang our hat out there. The vol, if you're wondering, at about a 28, almost exactly, up 3.8 points this week. So a little bit of juice out there in the Copper Hills. Skew last week, puts were 4.9%. Rich this week, 3.6%. Again, we came off a bit, so not exactly surprising. The calls last week, 3.1% cheap this week, 1.2%. So the call's getting a bit of a bid. Not quite bid up, but less cheap than they were this time last week. And in terms of activity, we had a bit of a tie here between the four puts in October doing about 1,300 contracts and the six calls in December also doing 1,300 contracts. And you know what? Also, the six calls in March of next year also doing 1,300 contracts. So... That is a weird unanimity of paper here. <laughs> Looks like a 5-6 vertical went up about 1,000 by 1,300 times. Uh, traded two days in a row. So fives and sixes. Similar paper both days. So that's out in December. Let's look really quickly because we're coming up against it here. In De- that's December. Assuming that's March of next year. This is December. Also, we saw fives and sixes going up here as well. Maybe some closing paper of this vertical, the 5-6 vertical taking it off and Deese rolling it out to March. It is eerily similar size to be going up on the same strike. So probably related paper. Mr. Dan, you know, the story of copper for a long time has been, it's pretty much just a proxy for Chinese demand, but that's kind of evolved a little bit. What are your thoughts on what's going on out there in copper right now, sir? Well, first, I think you're right on target with those verticals. And it does say something about the outlook for copper. What do people perceive about this market. And from my point of view, I have to tell you, Mark, it really surprises me. I'm surprised that we're back down at to the magic four, that $4 level. Uh, and I think if you're, again, on the short side of that market, be cautious at these levels. Uh, I, this is where we could get a bounce. $4 is significant. We saw it earlier this year, back in March and April. It's also where buyers came back in in that market. Uh, The demand globally, you're right, it's been softened in, or the point of view is that it's softened in China. Uh, And they consume about 48% of the global supply of copper. Uh, We're number two, the U.S. is number two, Germany's number three in consumption patterns. So, but that demand hasn't gone away. And you know what's also interesting about China when it comes to copper, just from a longer term outlook, is that, you know, China's purchased a mountain in Peru. Is Peru or China? I mean, uh, Chile. I think it's Peru. And they're moving a village next to the mountain, uh, and that mountain has copper. And uh, it's a drop in the bucket for what China needs. China's demand for copper is incredibly high, and it's going to be incredibly high going into the future. Remember, we had over 350 million people move from the farm to the city in the last five to 10 years. So it's the population of the United States moving to the city. And those people want stuff. And China's got to make stuff for them. And plus, they also have to make stuff that we buy. And China also has the rights to copper uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, They purchased that a number of years ago, actually. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds for them. So I don't think the demand has gone away. This is more of a perception move than it is a supply and demand move. So I'd be cautious on the short side. I think we could have a bounce here at $4. We've come off of that a bit, as you mentioned. 404 is about where we are right now. And if buyers are here, this is kind of like what you and I were talking about in the equity world. We want to see that positive close on Friday. And then the issue is, is it sellers buying to take profits or has this market gotten cheap enough to find new buyers coming back in? So Friday will be the first step in answering those questions. And then Monday 
do we get follow through to the upside? And that could imply the potential for a rally. So it's a very interesting marketplace. 420 to the upside, uh, four, actually 415 to 420 could be significant levels of resistance if the price does start to move up. So we have some interesting parameters to look at uh, with copper. It is a unique market because we don't have a substitute for it. You know, when you look at car production, 40 to 90 pounds of copper is used in a car, depending on the model, four times that amount in an electric vehicle. We use 400 to 600 pounds of copper in a new home. So in the United States, our demand hasn't totally gone away with this market. And so I just, I find it fascinating and I don't see the fundamental drivers to push us below $4. All right, listeners, it's about that time. Time for you guys to take the reins with your questions and comments. Time for your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options. Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, StockTwits.com slash Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, let's get out there to your question. Sometimes we turn the spotlight back on you like we're doing this week with our question of the week. Go play along at Options is the place to go. We asked you this week. Everyone has volatility on the brain. I wonder why. <laughs> but which product holds the volatility crown? Quite simply, which of these has the highest 30-day volatility? No cheating. Use your gut. We gave you four choices. Bitcoin, VIX, so volatility itself, crude oil, or Tesla. Uh, Dan, I'm curious for you, if you have a vote, have at it. And then B, more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for? I would say probably Tesla. They may pick Tesla. Uh, I'm looking at crude oil. Bitcoin's been relatively sideways, so I don't really see that happening. VIX, uh, yeah, I'd say crude oil. Interesting. Right now, our audience is lining up firmly around Bitcoin, sir. 52.5% oh. for Bitcoin, followed by 22.2% for VIX, 17.5% for Tesla. No love for crude, Dan. You're by yourself. Only 7.9%. <laughs> hey, that's good, though, Mark, because that's what makes a market, right? Is that we don't there all we go. agree. So that's a good thing. It wouldn't be as fun if it was 99% in one. It's, cool. exactly. it's 55. We're close to it, but not, not a ton. Speaking of interesting stuff, we got a question here from Rick. Question a lot of people have on their brains, Dan. He wants to know, what's the deal with CME buying SIBO? Is it happening? Yeah, this is an interesting story. This news broke pretty much right as we were recording our options boot camp show yesterday. And it's a thing a lot of us have speculated might happen for a long time, over a decade, and a lot of us maybe kind of thought the time had passed for that, and then, boom, out of the blue, this story drops, and I know a lot of the reporters who cover this space, and some of them have been around for a long time, and one of them is Philip Stafford over there at FT. He's not the kind of guy who I would think would, you know, there's some reporters out there might get the bit in their teeth and run with a story kind of half-cocked. He's not one of those people. He usually will dot his I's and cross his T's. He also had some very precise details about the acquisition price and everything else. Not the kind of thing you just throw up willy nilly. And also uncharacteristically, CME came out and almost immediately, very strenuously denied it, which is kind of out of character for them and not kind of the way they would usually uh, proceed in this kind of thing. And then also there's some good reporting on the other side. Bloomberg put out a piece and Matt Light Slicing was part of that. And he's also very diligent saying it's not happening. So there's Good reporters on both sides. It's interesting timing that it would kind of come out of the blue, that it would happen now of all times. Uh, we saw a SIBO stock pop off the news, go from about 123 up to, it looks like about 139 before coming off pretty much right back down to 123 again. So I had quite the pop. And it uh, looks like the, the denial 
from a CME helped put out some of those fires, but they started picking up again today because the stock today is up about, oh, five points. <laughs> so the market is selling off and I should say the stock, at least there is picking up. So it's, it's a bit of a weird one. I have no inside info on this one, unfortunately for you, Rick. But it is curious. I, I tend to, if Phil is going to run with the front page FT thing on this, I kind of tend to think he he checked his sources on this. So I'm a little surprised to see such a strident denial of it come out of CME. Usually it's the old no comment on rumors acquisitions kind of thing. This was not that. This was definitely completely false, which, you know, if you've ever dealt with CME, and we have, obviously, <laughs> uh, that's not usually how they play the game. Uh, I'm curious for you, uh, Dan, you've been around CME for a long time. What were your thoughts when you heard this news? And then B, uh, what are your thoughts as Rick wants to know, do you think it's going to happen? Well, you know, I think your summary was excellent. Uh, it, and it isn't typical behavior on the CME part to come out with such a strong statement in that regard. A no comment statement would be more expected. And um, it's, you know, this has been thrown around before. Uh, is it a logical fit? Well, it does give them an entree into the securities world in terms of the equity side. Uh, so maybe there's some... Uh, to say diversification for their portfolio, that it makes sense. I personally hope it doesn't happen. I like the idea of independent pieces out there. Uh, independence means you have choice. And if everything gets pulled together into one, one entity, uh, I just don't think it's good for competition. I like the idea that there's other things out there. You know, and Siebel also does have a future side to it as well. And I like that idea because it's another product line, another exchange. It's good for everyone to have competition, I believe. It's kind of the American way in a, in a way because it, it keeps us striving to be better if we have competition. So I, personally, I'm not keen on the idea, actually. And, uh, but yet you're right. The, the commentary that we've seen on both sides uh, is puzzling, uh, which implies that it may be happening actually uh, as well, because I don't think those numbers are thrown around uh, by, you know, just grabbing numbers out of the sky to make a statement. So I, both sides are legitimate sources. And uh, I think it's probably leaning to something happening. Uh -oh. if I had a you're talking side. yourself into it, Dan. Now you're talking me into yeah, it because you're talking yourself into it. <laughs> but you're right. There you're is kind of, right. if you look at like the CME pie, I've always said for years, there's kind of one wedge missing and the, the yeah, CBOE would certainly fit into that pie very nicely. And clearly they're playing a lot more on the volatility front. And clearly over the last year and a half, equity options have been where all the growth has been. So it does make sense from that perspective. Valuation, yeah. you could argue maybe not. I'm with you on the competition side. I mean, this would certainly, this would be literally the one Chicago exchange. You know, there used to be an exchange called One Chicago. This would be it. The Board of Trade, CME, and CBOE all together in one entity. And I have to imagine uh, there would be maybe some antitrust issues with that as well. It would maybe, maybe might raise some red flags. That could be another reason why they, and I know in the past, they've demurred from doing this for those reasons. So it would be interesting right. to see if, if that landscape has changed. I know the CME folks have also, Never really been keen on engaging with the SEC if they didn't have to. And by buying CBOE, you're very firmly in the SEC camp now. So there's a lot of reasons that would say no. But I don't know. Dan, you're, you're talking me into it now. <laughs> you're a I dangerous man. Yeah, you kind of I can hear you flipping right there on, this, well, on the show, which is kind of funny. You know, Mark, it's what you were saying, too, the, the reaction that the CME had. I mean, there's something to be read into that when they were that vehement about saying no way, no how, not happening. Um, so you kind of planted the seeds for me a bit <laughs> as I talked about it. So I'd love to ask Philip what, what, what was going on. I'm sure he's not going to tell me right now. He's in the middle of it. But uh, what set the bee off in his bonnet on this as well? Interesting stuff here. I don't think we've heard the last of this, Rick. And if you believe Dan, it's happening. Maybe tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, we won't have the show on to do it. it means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn. It was, certainly was a fun one. We got a great smattering of products on the show today. But before we go, Mr. Dan, if folks want to check out your videos or anything else you're working on, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, they can just go to dangramza.com. 
Uh, I, it's a free video. I do it every day. Uh, it covers 22 different markets, six different sectors. So stock indices, currencies, interest rates, metals, uh, energy, and agricultural products. Uh, and the idea behind it is if you've never looked at futures, a place to begin is just watch them. And what you would see there would be commentary, my thoughts on how I would approach these markets. You're going to see red and green lines, which represent buy and sell levels. That's for my reference. I'm not making buy and sell recommendations, but just trying to share how I would approach looking at those markets. And if you only trade stock indices, maybe you might want to look at crude oil or some other marketplace. And that may give you some insights into how to look at those markets as well. So that's the intent behind it. And hopefully people will find it out. It, it, it's watching over 150 countries, which truly amazes me. But um, so anyways, that's what's happening with that. There you go. Check him out. Dan Gramza is the place to go. Dan Gramza, G-R-A-M-Z-A dot com. And of course, you know where to go for all of our reports. Semigroup.com slash Twifo or slash Twio is the place to go. For all that info, and if you want more info about what's lighting it up on the dark side, on the light side, on the skew, the volatility in the world of small caps, or maybe you want to go Russell 1000, it's up to you. Pick your poison. FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell.com is the place to go for all that data. Of course, give them a follow on the old Twitter machine while you're at it. At FTSE Russell is the place to go. We got to get on out of here, but we'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views and then for all of you folks in the secret handshake club you get options oddities 2 p.m central 3 p.m east and then we're back again next week all the way through to another thursday another episode of this week in futures options we'll see you then this week in futures options is brought to you by cme group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftseRussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>